So the James Webb Telescope was named after James E. Webb. Funnily enough, us astronomers and astrophysicists, we're really, you know, imaginative. Um, and he was an administrator of NASA from 1961 to 1968, which if you know your Apollo history, you'll know that's kind of pivotal to all of those moon, moon launches and moon landings. So he was quite important to the Apollo program, program which was groundbreaking in the day and that's why they've given the James Webb Space Telescope which we all just call Webb now uh, its name because it's going to be groundbreaking itself. So why is it such a big deal? The James Webb Space Telescope is incredible. It is going to be launched into space, so it's a space telescope. It's been under development since the late 1980s, uh, and it has had many delays, uh, which we can definitely talk about. And it's the largest and most powerful space telescope ever built. And it's the last of its kind of these big missions. It's a successor to Hubble. You might know of Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble has all those beautiful images of so many pictures that are just iconic now and lots of people actually have them printed out and on their wall, you know, of, of star forming regions and nebulae and Hubble took those in the visible uh, light spectrum. But uh, so, so James Webb is going to go up there and it's going to actually look further and deeper than we've ever done before. It's a huge collaboration. It's governments, academia, private sector, 14 different countries with an accumulated total of about 40 million hours to build. I can understand why its launch has been delayed over so many years. Such a complex and massive project. Yes, it's complex, it's large. So it's a feat of engineering. It has a sun shield, so it has to protect itself from the sun. The instruments need to be away from the sun and it has this enormous sun shield that is the size of a tennis court, right? And its primary mirror, so telescopes need a mirror to sort of collect and focus the light. And in telescopes on Earth, you know, we talk about them being just sort of, you know, face-sized or, or whatever, but this one is 6.5 times 25 metres in size, this primary mirror. And I don't know how much you know about rockets, Yvonne, but I don't know how anybody's planning on putting that in a telescope. So this is where the feat of engineering comes in. And this mirror and this sun shield have actually been designed to fold up and go inside a rocket to be launched. And then after launch, when it's on its way to where it's going to sit, uh, which is, you know, 150 million miles away, it's going to unfold this sun shield and unfold this mirror. And if you have a look at pictures of Webb online, it looks like a honeycomb. And they're those beautiful gold pieces of mirror that all fold up. 18 hexagonal segments, which is the largest mirror ever in space. And they need to be aligned to within nanometers, which is, you know, one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair. So cut up a human hair, 10,000 slices. That's how well they need to be aligned. So that's the sort of feat of engineering we're talking about here. Um, the other reason it's being delayed is that it's not like Hubble. Hubble is in low Earth orbit which means that astronauts can actually go up and fix and modify and replace bits on Hubble or add bits on Hubble. And in fact, they actually had to do that when Hubble originally launched. If we couldn't do that, we never would have seen anything out of Hubble, really. So, you know, Hubble's been lucky like that, but Webb is actually not going into low Earth orbit. Webb is being sent 150 million miles away from Earth, and it's sitting in a place called L2, which is Lagrange point two. And what's special about about this point is that if you line up the sun, the earth, then you have L2 behind the earth. And that's a special gravitationally stable place. And that's important for Webb because we want Webb to sit there and look out at the universe and not use very much energy to sort of uh, combat the orbit around Earth that Hubble has to do. So while Webb is in a really sort of energy um, efficient space, what it means is that once it's there, we can't fix it, we can't change it. So really, every time something tiny, tiny, tiny goes wrong, it's huge because we're never gonna be able to address it. It's basically address it now or never address it. And for a $9.6 billion, US billion dollar project, uh, that's a big deal. Gosh, you'd want to get it right, wouldn't you? Definitely want to get that right. <laughs> well, Claire, what's the main aim of having these amazingly powerful instruments bobbing about in space? 
So it's going to be launched. Uh, it's a 6,200 kilogram spacecraft folded up inside an Ariane 5 rocket. It will be launched at 12.20 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, which uh, for Australian Eastern Daylight Time, that's on the 25th of December, Australian Eastern Day Daylight Time at 11.20 p.m. So after you've finished, you know, your Christmas Day celebrations, you can sit down and actually watch it launch on NASA TV. Um, you probably want to come back and, and watch it after a little while because it takes 30 days to get to the Lagrange Point 2, during which time it's actually going to unfold. Once it's at Lagrange Point 2, it's actually going to be about six months before we start to get scientific pictures out of Webb. Now, what are we going to see? Well, what isn't it going to see? It's going to have visible capability like Hubble, but it's also going to have a special uh, near-infrared uh, vision of the universe that Hubble does not have. The exciting thing about near-infrared, I always say it's a bit like one of those comics where you have this seedy character who's got these, you know, goggles that can see through clothes, right, at people's, like, undergarments. And that's kind of what what James Webb is going to be doing. It's we're not looking at undergarments, that's for sure, but it's trying to peer, it'll be peering through dust and gas, which you can't do in the visible and optical spectrums of, of, of Hubble, of those wavelengths, because they actually block you vis uh, looking through them. But Webb will be able to look through that and actually look into the nurseries of star birth. It's going to go right back to the very, very early universe. We're talking the youngest stars, galaxies, and this time when light was first released into the universe right after the Big Bang, known as the Epoch of Reionization. It's going to look within our solar system at planets and atmospheres and tell us more about um, our own solar system and also look outwards and look at exo planets as well and try to characterize the atmospheres there. This instrument is so sensitive, they say that it can detect the heat signature of a bumblebee on the moon from Earth. That's the type of sensitivity we're talking about. And why do we put these things up there? Why do we care? Well, for me, science is just a big game. The life is just a big game. And science's job is to actually learn the rules better. Every time we make an observation, every time we have a theory and we test it and we improve the theory, we're adding information about to ourselves about what we know about the game. And the more rules you know about the game, the more creative you can be and the better you can actually live your life and the better that we can all live our lives. So every time we add information to our rule book about how the universe game works, the better we we do. Well, that's a great explanation, Claire, and we just can't wait for the web to launch. Claire, thank you so much. We've loved having you on our show this year. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Have a great break.